We know that stars exist that based on stars electromagnetic radiation. It's the only, well, it used to be the only evidence we have for stars. Now, now we have gravitational waves, but for the most part, we still depend on electromagnetic radiation. The easiest one to think about is light. We can see the light from stars. Now, we also have satellites that can see using gamma rays. We have satellites that can view in ultraviolet, like the Hubble Space Telescope. So we have technology that can see other wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum. And we can use those along with our eyes to see more about the universe. So we can use uh, light and electromagnetic radiation to see a lot of things about stars, like how massive the star is, what the temperature of the star is, what kind of dust is between us and the star. Determine how far away a star is, certain stars using their distance and luminosity. So some stars flash on and off, on and off, on and off. They're called Cepheid variables. And we can actually use how bright they are to determine how far away they are. Now, not every star is the same way. Some stars are just dimmer because they're farther away. Some stars are brighter just because they're closer. So it really depends on the star. Now, luminosity. What is luminosity? It is the total amount of energy emitted per unit of time. But who really knows what total amount of energy emitted per unit of time is? So think of it like uh, a light bulb or a horsepower or something like that. It is how much energy is being used by whatever is emitting the light. Now for a light bulb, that's easy. 100 watts, 75 watts, 25 watts, it's measured in watts. So it might also be measured in horsepower, but for one thing, we don't want to measure in a star horsepower because, for example, Gillespie 223, if we measure that in horsepower, that small red dwarf star would be 31 billion billion horsepower. Yeah, no. We're not going to be measuring in 31 billion billion horsepowers for the smallest stars. So instead, we use terms of luminosity of the sun. You'll see it measured as solar luminosities. So for example, Beta Juice, a red giant, or a red supergiant if you want to be more specific, has a solar luminosity of 100,000. That's nice and easy to write. Gillespie 223, instead of 31 billion billion horsepower, is measured in 0. 0.000062 solar luminosities, or sun's brightnesses. So when you see an HR diagram and you see luminosity, now you know, it's just measured in how bright compared it is to the sun. Is it 100,000 times brighter than the sun? Is it 10,000? Is it two times brighter? Is it 0. 0.0000 times brighter than the sun? Who knows? Now, luminosity and magnitude, absolute magnitude are somewhat related because we base our luminosity off the star's absolute magnitude. So for absolute magnitude, what it is, if you imagine taking all the stars and lining them up, 32 light years away from the viewer, you. And then you take away all the gas and dust and galaxies and anything that's in the way from that star or stellar object. And so what happens is the smaller, or sorry, the dimmer it is, the higher the number. So it's kind of like golf. The brighter it is, the lower the number. So for example, the sun is actually not that bright. It gets a positive 4.6 or 4 value. The North Star, which is about 4,400, yeah, much, much brighter, 400 times brighter, it's a value of about 2. Betelgeuse, which is much, much brighter than our star, if you saw right back here, 100,000 times brighter than our star, has a value of negative 7.2. So you can see negative number more bright, positive number less bright. Now, for one thing I do want to point out for absolute magnitude, the moon does not emit its own light, so it does not have an absolute magnitude. In order for an object to be considered having an absolute magnitude, it's got to emit its own light. So a light bulb would have an absolute magnitude. It would be a really, really large positive number, but it emits its own light, so it would count. A star emits its own light, so it does count. A planet does not emit its own light, so it does not count for absolute magnitude. Now, apparent magnitude is different. Apparent magnitude is how it appear to your eyes right here on Earth if you're looking at it. So objects that are behind a cloud of gas and dust, behind a nebula, that counts. Objects that are really, really far away, that matters. Objects that are close, well, that matters as well. So for example, if you were to look right up next to a light bulb with your eye, that would be the brightest apparent magnitude thing in the sky. It would be the light bulb that's one centimeter away from your eye. But that doesn't really count. So what is mostly used in astronomy is going to be absolute magnitude because apparent magnitude is kind of influenced by what's in the way. Now, for absolute and apparent magnitude, think of this example. Let's say you have a car headlight. Now, the car headlights are not changing. They remain the same absolute magnitude no matter how far away they get. 
So for example, the lights here are gonna be the same brightness as they were here, as they were here. It doesn't change, the car isn't changing its light. However, a parent magnitude, as that car gets farther away, this is a lot of bright and it gets less bright and less bright as it gets farther away. So that there's a difference between the two of them. Brighter is it's closer, that's apparent. Absolute is just how bright it is wherever it is. It could be on the moon and it would still have the same absolute magnitude. Now here's a couple examples of apparent magnitude objects in our solar system. Obviously the brightest thing in the sky with apparent magnitude is gonna be the sun. It's really close compared to the stars and it's a star, so it's really, really bright. Mercury, not very bright. Notice even though it's in our solar system and it's, well, kind of bright, it's too far away from us compared to something like Venus, negative, negative 4.89. That's much, much, much brighter than Mercury is. Now, obviously, Mercury's number can change because it goes around the, the sun, and sometimes it's closer, sometimes farther away. But yeah, not very bright compared to Venus. Full moon, negative 12.9, that's pretty bright because, well, the moon is really close to us, and uh, well, it's really close to us. Actually, that's the only reason. <laughs> If the moon was where Venus was, it would not be anywhere near this number right here. I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, Mars, negative 2.7. And International Space Station is even closer to us. It's only about uh, 100,000, or sorry, yeah, 100,000 meters above us. So uh, it's really, really bright because it's really, really close. Now, uh, stuff that is above, point, or above 7 on the charts, or anything in the solar system above seven in the absolute or no apparent magnitude you can't actually see with your naked eye so something like neptune you're not going to be able to see it with a naked eye not even on the darkest of nights alpha centauri you might be able to see it not here in town but if you went to somewhere pretty dark it's positive 0.5 titan not going to see it moon of saturn even though we can see saturn not going to be able to see its moon it's just too dim and then anything above a 9.5 positive apparent magnitude even binoculars won't work you're going to need a telescope to see it so something like Pluto, mm -mm, gonna need a telescope. It's really, really, really far away from the sun. So it's not that bright. Some, how about some dwarf planets or asteroids, Sharon and Eris? Yeah, they're pretty dim as well. Halley's Comet, now sometimes you can see it, but the, that doesn't happen very often. So about 60, 50, 40, 40 years from now, this number will drop and we'll be able to see it again as it gets close to the sun. But right now it's really, really far away from the sun. So plus 28.2, I doubt even the, well, the Hubble Space Telescope might be able to see that, but not very easily, that's for sure. One more thing. Uh, yes. Let's go ahead and go over temperature. So temperature depends on, no, color. So we're going to do a quick intro on HR diagrams before you see it on the next unit. So for an HR diagram, it's star brightness or luminosity. So remember how we talked about luminosity today? Well, this is why, because you're going to use luminosity on an HR diagram. And it's plotted against star color and temperature. So the temperature of the star is down here on the x-axis, and you can see it starts out with the coldest temperatures on the right, the red dwarfs around 3,000 Kelvin, and it heats up to about 30,000 plus Kelvin on the left side. So it's a little bit different than most graphs you're going to see. That's for sure with HR diagrams. Now, when we're talking about HR diagrams, for main sequence stars, brightness and mass are related. So the more mass a star has, the higher up or higher luminosity on the main sequence it has. So for example, um, our sun, which is right here with a solar mass of one, has luminosity about one solar. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Now we go and notice these stars appear in the left that are higher luminosity. Notice how they're bigger than the sun. They have more mass. They're going to have more luminosity. Stars that have less luminosity down here, like Proxima Centauri or Wolf 359, these red dwarfs, they have less luminosity and they also have less mass than the sun. So the main sequence, at least this line right here, is great for telling, okay, do I have more mass? Yes. More luminosity. Do I have less? Yes. Less. Now, once you get into giants and supergiants, it changed a little bit because the giants, you could have a red giant with the same mass of the sun, but it's going to have more luminosity because it's got a larger radius than the sun. So a bigger sun or a bigger star is just going to shine brighter because there's more of it, even though it could have the same mass. Now for the supergiants, same thing. The giants could actually have the same luminosity, but as you get in the supergiants, they have a larger radius. So as it gets larger radius, it cools down and has a lower temperature than the giants. 
Now, last thing, yes, I talked about giants. Ah, yes, white dwarfs are below the main sequence. So, you know, you got the main sequence of stars, you got giants and supergiants, but what about white dwarfs? Well, they're down here. They have a lower luminosity than most of the main sequence stars. I mean, they have higher than some of the red dwarfs. And they also have a higher temperature than a lot of the main sequence stars. You can see Cirrus B right down here is almost 30,000 Kelvin. So they're interesting objects. 